years in East Lansing. Dr. Larson received his PhD in geology from Ohio State University in 1976 and taught hydrogeology and glacial geology at MSU for 37 years until he retired in 2013. He is now a professor emeritus. A sig significant part of Dr. Larson's research has involved investigating glaciers in Alaska and Iceland and mapping glacial deposits in New England and Michigan for the U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the New Hampshire Geological Survey, and the Michigan Geological Survey. One of Dr. Larson's areas of particular interest is the geology of the Great Lakes and, and the Michigan shore, which led him to write a professional society field guide that was published in 1988 and two peer-reviewed journal articles that were published in 1986 and 2008. Dar Dr. Larson today will explain the origin of the Great Lakes about 900,000 years ago, as well as the region's history during and after the last gla glaciation. He will also discuss the modern shore characteristics of the Great Lakes and present a history of shore erosion south of St. Joseph, Michigan. Uh, Graham, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon. Let me, uh, I've got a little signal here. Uh, can everybody see the screen okay? All right, great. It looks great at home. All right, good. Um, glad to see this many people. Uh, um, most of my students never show up for anything like this. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, I, I am glad that I do have one problem there. There's a nice lady over there wearing a blue uh, top, and she's got a mask saying Michigan. And I don't like that. I was thinking about asking her to leave. <laughs> but um, having gotten my Ph.D. from Ohio State and then uh, um, taught at Michigan State for over 30 years, you know, I, I, I'm not offended. But I can't say we did beat you this year. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the uh, slides, and I will um, basically focus on two things. One is the origin of the Great Lakes. This is a jewel that we have, particularly here in Michigan, since we are bordered by three of the Great Lakes, um, oh, actually oh, four. Uh, if you uh, count Lake Erie, and their evolution is quite complex. So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of the geology of the region and also then how the lakes came about. And then near the end, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some aspects of coastal erosion that's occurring along the shore of Lake Michigan here. Um, one of the things that uh, Tom Wolf didn't mention is that I do work for the Corps of Engineers. Well, he did mention that, but it's mainly uh, I'm a geologist and I do consulting for them, and my work involves mapping the geology along the lake shore. And I'm also involved with the Department of Justice in Washington in terms of litigations that are occurring between property owners and the Corps of Engineers. So I, I'm still in involved in research, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the issues related to erosion along the shore. So let me begin then uh, with the first slide. And so far, nothing's happening. So Graham, if you'll Push take your button. mouse and click onto that slide, then it, the, it'll tell the computer that to wake it up, and now you can use your left, right arrows. All right, hopefully it's awake now. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, okay we're in business now. I'm gonna move the lectern back a little bit so the people at home 
can see me a little better because I like to kind of move rather than being chained to the uh, lectern and there's a, a more of a field of view here. Um, let's start off with the geology. Now, when I do these slides, you can see at the top there's uh, a number here, 17.1 preglacial landscape. And this basically is one of my lectures from class. And uh, this is lecture 17.1, which involves basically the origin of the Great Lakes. And then right below it, you'll see some uh, highlights of what I'm going to be explaining about the slide. So first thing that's important to recognize is like we're right here in Holland, Michigan, but when we look at the geology of the Great Lakes, what we see is that this region here that are multiple colors are basically Paleozoic sedimentary rocks. There are limestones, there are shales, there are sandstones, and that's what makes this topography here, and it's basically a lowlands. <coughs> And in contrast to that, if you go up north, across the Mackinac Bridge and then to Sault Ste. Marie, you get into this canary color, and that is the Canadian Shield. And it is very old. In fact, um, it's greater than 541 million years old, whereas everything further south in this lowland area is uh, less than that in age. And in fact, it gets uh, the, the oldest bedrock around here is around 200 million years. And what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit more about the geology and how it relates to the Great Lakes as we move along. Okay, so that's the bedrock geology. Before glaciation, there was no evidence of glaciation here in Michigan. And what there were was rivers, just like you would see down south, rivers cutting through the landscape, and it would be basically just bedrock. And these rivers were of two different systems. There was a river, this is before the Great Lakes were formed, there's a river system here, which is called the Laurentian River System, and it flowed eastward into the North Atlantic. And then there was another river system which is down here. This is the Taze Muhammad system, and it had tributaries all through here in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And it flowed up, made a loop, and then headed south, and it discharged into the Gulf of Mexico. So the landscape would have been totally different here. You would have basically have seen the bedrock topography, much like you would see maybe down in Tennessee, and then these major river systems, very much like the Ohio River system, a lot of discharge. Well, this landscape was then altered, and it was altered by glaciation. There was a continental glaciation that overrode this landscape, and uh, it extended all the way down south to about S Cincinnati, Ohio. And so we're right up in here. So you can see it was quite extensive. And there's a big, broad lobe here that took advantage of the low area. Here's where the Appalachians are, and that kind of inhibited the glacier from going further south. Well, these gla this glaciation tremendously changed the topography, uh, uh, particularly around here in the lower part of the peninsula. It also changed the topography or the landscape in the upper part of the uh, um, Michigan, upper Michigan. Hi. Yes. Okay. Okay. Testing one, two, three. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Ah. I can also raise my voice if you like, but I, I was explaining earlier on when I used to lecture, I'd have 300 students way up there, and half of them were, were asleep, the other ones were recovering from the weekend. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of hard, and 
in order for them to pay attention, I would speak softly without a mic, and it would force them to listen. <laughs> you know, well, it, I tr maybe some of them, okay. All right, can I, if you can't hear me in the audience, just raise your hand and that, that'll be a signal to me, okay? All right, when the glaciers came down to Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, which is about here, it tremendously altered the landscape and all this area are uh, basically uh, deposits left by the, the glacier. And in green there uh, is <coughs> an outline of the glacial moraines. And these moraines were very low subdued ridges left behind by the glacier and they outline the, um, the, the lobe that entered into Michigan. And if you look at the moraines here, you can see a whole bunch here in uh, northern Ohio. And these are related to the uh, Erie Lobe. This is ice that came down and terminated about here. And then we see a whole bunch of lobes here, which is due to the Lake Michigan Lobe that came down this way. And these uh, pretty much represent outlines associated with the retreating ice. And there's a third lobe that's associated with Michigan, and that's the Saginaw Lobe that you can see the moraines here. So it, it in essence, what's happened is Michigan, the lower part of Michigan, was invaded by three ice lobes that eventually merged and extended all the way down to about the Ohio River. So what I'm driving at is the landscape that we see here is a relatively new landscape. It's a landscape that has developed or say the last million years, but particularly since the last 100,000 years. Oops. <coughs> if you were in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, what you would see is the landscape that is a result of glaciation. It's a little bit different than here. What, what you would see is bedrock and very little in terms of glacial deposits just a thin veneer, in some cases very patchy. And in other places, you would see that the bedrock was gouged out. And this is the tremendous power of the glacier to erode into the bedrock. And so when you're in the Upper Peninsula, particularly the western part, the landscape looks totally different than down here because it's dominated by the old bedrock, the Precambrian bed bedrock, but also sculptured by glaciers coming down. Now in contrast to that, you come down here in the lower peninsula of Michigan, and this particular picture is uh, around the Kellogg Biological Station near Kalamazoo, Michigan. And what you see is very rolling topography, and the glacial sediments that overlie the Paleozoic bedrock are several, in many cases over 200 feet thick. And so think of this a as a covering, hiding the geology below it and also those old river systems. Um, way in the distance here, if you look all the way back here, that's one of the moraines, okay? And as I mentioned, these are very broad, long ridges left behind. Now, if you drive over them, you won't notice them. I will notice them because this is my training. You won't get a nosebleed, I guarantee you. It, they're very low. But some of these ridges can be traced for hundreds of miles, in one case, 500 miles. That's the Port Huron moraine. <coughs> so let's get back to the geology now. What happened here, if you remember, prior to glaciation, there were these valleys, river valleys. <coughs> and these river valleys extended in areas where there was very soft bedrock. And if you look over here, see this kind of uh, color, upper Devonian sedimentary rock? Um, it extends right along here, and you can see it's mostly shales. So if we look here under Lake Michigan, <coughs> it is underlain mainly by shales soft rocks 
that the glaciers coming down can take a, advantage of and erode. If you go to the side, <coughs> for example, right here, the yellow, this is Silurian <coughs> sedimentary rocks, and it's mainly dolomites, <coughs> a very hard type of limestone. Now let's go over to Lake Huron, and we see again that same color underneath. You see how it loops around like this? Well, Lake Huron is also in a, a low area that made out of shale that was easily scooped out by the glaciers as they came down. And if we start to go down to Lake Erie, again, there's that same yellow color. The ice coming down in here took advantage of that soft uh, shale and scooped it out. <coughs> so <coughs> we've got three of the Great Lakes that are associated with uh, shales, that the glacier took advantage of where the shales were and scooped out these basins. If we go to Lake Ontario, we see it's this purple color, and these are Ordovician sedimentary rocks, but notice it's again a shale. It's an older shale, but it's, it was soft enough so that when the ice came down this way, it also scooped out that basin. <coughs> So we're basically seeing four of the Great Lakes are there because the glacier took advantage of the soft bedrock, the shale, and allowed basins to form. Now when we get up to Lake Superior, it's a bit different. And what we're seeing here is that this Lake Superior occurs within this Precambrian rock, which is basically crystalline rock, granites and metamorphic rocks. And so we have to kind of explain what's happening there. So let's take a look again at two profiles. This is the one going through the lower peninsula of Michigan. And we're seeing the geology in cross section. And what we're seeing is that Michigan, lower peninsula of Michigan, is essentially bedrock associated with the Paleozoic. The Paleozoic <coughs> is sitting on top of very, very old Precambrian rock, and it's bent as a basin. And when you look at this, think of these as uh, uh, dishes piled up on top of each other, okay? You put a big dish, a smaller dish, a smaller dish. These are layers of sedimentary rocks <coughs> uh, getting younger in age as you go up. Well, when you look at Michigan, the map of Michigan, you're seeing the edge of the, the plates. This is the oldest plate, and then the youngest plate, uh, younger plate, and then the very youngest plate. And right here is the shale. This is where Lake Michigan is. And here's the shale again. This is where Lake Huron is. And here is the older shale. This is where uh, Lake Ontario is. However, up in here, there is no shale. So w what happened here? Well, here's this cross-section. If we go from here to here, that's this cross-section going across. And here's Lake Superior, right in there. And what we're seeing is that this is a kind of a dip in the rock. Over here is very, very hard crystalline rock. Over here is very, very hard crystalline rock crystalline rock, but here's softer crystalline rock. It's still very hard, but it, it was soft enough <coughs> so that when the glaciers came down, it eroded a basin. Now here and here are little islands, and I'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, with actually, one island, uh, our Royal, and then the other one is the Keweenaw Peninsula, but uh, on I'll mention that in a moment, how they came about. So what we're seeing in summary is the Great Lakes are there because of the softness of the geology. Particular rocks were softer than other rocks. And so when the glacier came down, it took advantage of those softer rocks. And in fact, that's where the river valleys, the two big drainage system occurred originally in those softer rocks. And then you got even more erosion by the ice coming down. Uh, let me go back with this. 
Let's look at a couple of other things. I mentioned an island here, Isle Royal. Anybody been to Isle Royal? Yeah, it's, it's uh, mainly a, a basalt, a very hard rock, okay? And if you go to the Leelanau Peninsula, that's basically a basalt. And if we look at it, there's the basalt coming up like this. It's a kind of a, a, another bowl-shaped thing. And this basalt is much harder than the adjacent rocks, and so that's why the island's there. And in fact, the reason that the uh, uh, um, uh, peninsula here is there is because, again, you've got very hard rock pop popping out over an area of very uh, um, softer rock. Okay, let's look at some other things when you're in at the Great Lakes. If you go over here, this is the Dor Peninsula, okay? This is a peninsula that separates Green Bay from Lake Michigan. And let's ask ourselves, why is that there? Well, the reason it's there is that this particular rock is the dolomite. It's very hard. And so that peninsula is there because of the resistance of that rock. Here's another peninsula. Anybody know what the name is? Bruce Peninsula, and it's a Canadian peninsula. And again, it's there because of the hardness of the rock, the ni uh, basically Silurian Niagara ro uh, uh, rock. If we follow that, it goes like this, and there's Niagara Falls. And it's there, Niagara Falls is there because of the very hard rock. And in fact, when we start to look at these, these islands here, they're there also because of this Silurian dolomite, the very hard rocks. And so what we can see is the shape of the Great Lakes are very much affected by both the geology, the underlying bedrock, plus also the ability of the glacier to erode. In some places it could erode very well, in some cases it couldn't. And so you end up with these lakes that have some wonderful characteristics. Okay, when the glacier came down, uh, as I've been explaining, it uh, scooped out the soft rocks, but it didn't just form a nice basin uh, like a, p a pot or something like that. If you go and look at the bottom of the lake, there are actually little, in, in little areas where it's deeper and other areas not so deep, and these are little basins. So. Let's take a look right here at Lake Michigan. This is a big basin that's been carved out by the glacier, but there are areas that are a little bit deeper, and these are all related to the hardness of the shale. In some areas it's harder than one in some places, and it's not as hard in other places. So what we're seeing is a bottom that's not perfectly smooth. It's a bit bumpy, and we're seeing again the influence of the bedrock. And if you go over to Lake, uh, uh, here on, you see the same thing. So there are sub-basins within the basins. Now, if we take a look at the drainage of the lakes, and I've put kind of a illustration here in terms that reflects the drainage, what we see is Lake Superior here drains into Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. And in fact, this here it is through St. Uh, Sault Ste. Marie down the St. Mary's River, and into Lake Huron. Now, the truth be told, Lake Huron and Lake Michigan are a misnomer. It's really only one lake, because if you look, they're connected. They're at the same level. So usually you don't name lakes at the same level two names, but in this case, the geography dictates that to the west it's got one name, to the east it's got another name, okay? So let's look at the drainage. From there, it goes down the St. Clair River, then into Lake St. Clair, then down the Detroit River, and feeds into Lake Erie. And then it goes over Niagara Falls on the Niagara River, into Lake Ontario, and then down the St. Lawrence into the North Atlantic. And so what we can see is there's a cascading effect. Lake Superior feeds <coughs> both Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, that feeds Lake Erie over Niagara Falls, then into Lake Ontario, 
and then down the St. Lawrence. <coughs> now, let's look at the depth of this e erosion, or basically how much uh, scooping out that the glacier do. Well, if we look over here at Lake Superior, we can see that the bottom of it is about 1,300 feet below the top, the lake level. Well, what's interesting is the bottom of Lake Superior is below sea level. That's a tremendous amount of erosion, and that attests to the ability of the glaciers to scoop out soft rock or semi-soft rock. If we look at whoops, Lake Michigan, anybody got an idea how deep it is? It's about 1,000 feet deep in the deepest part. And it's hard to visualize what a thousand feet is like. You know, it's, uh, it's about a fifth of a mile and all that. But the best way I explain to students how deep Lake Michigan is, if you take the what used to be called the Sears Tower in Ch uh, Chicago, it's got a new name now. I don't know why they did that, but let's call it the, it's the tallest building in Chicago. If you were to put that in the deepest part, how much of the building would be flooded? Anybody? No? Water level would go up about two-thirds up the tower. So if you took, <coughs> and took the tower and put it at the bottom of the Lake Michigan, the upper third <coughs> would, <coughs> excuse me, would be exposed. Okay? So next time you go out there, you can tell this to your kids or your grandkids. Okay? Say, some guy gave a lecture. And he put the Sears Tower into Lake Michigan, okay? But it's a good way to visualize, because you look out on Lake Michigan, and you, you it's hard to visualize just how deep it would be. <coughs> Lake Erie is the shallowest. In fact, you can see that uh didn't erode very deeply, and it's somewhat of a mystery why it didn't, because uh, Lake Ontario, it eroded quite well, and this is the same shale bedrock underneath as it is over here and over here. But it is fairly shallow, and that's why, it, for example, it's had problems before with pollution, because there's not much volume. It's big, but it's shallow, and pollution could uh, degrade the water very easily. Okay. I think I've done that one. Okay. <coughs> As I mentioned there, the, the Silurian dolomites can result in some uh, on nice aspects of the landscape around Lake Michigan or the Great Lakes. And the picture you see here, this is the Door Peninsula, and this is some of that Silurian dolomite. Okay? So if you ever wanted to see the hard rock, you go to the Door Peninsula. Over here is Mackinac Island. That, too, is part of this hard rock, the Silurian dolomite. And if you look at those islands in Lake Huron, that's the same thing. It's all due to that uh, hard rock. Okay, so next question then is, I explained that um, the landscape here was glaciated and changed the topography and deposited a layer of glacial sediment. <coughs> when did this first happen? And that's what a geologist does, not only looks at the geology, but has to come up with some explanation as to when did it happen. And so there are a couple of ways we can come up with this. Well, actually, there's probably three ways, but I'm going to go over just two of them. We're getting back to this drainage system that existed before the glaciers came down. And if you remember, one was the Laurentian system, and it drained off to the east. And it was mainly covered by the glacier, okay? Now, over here, was this other, the Taz Muhammad drainage system, and it wasn't covered by the glacier, but a little bit was, okay, here and there. And so if we look at the drainage, it came up like this and then swung around and then down, but when the glaciers came down, it blocked off part of that drainage right about here. And the end result is water backed up 
in the valley. And it did so in a lot of other places. You can see these little blue dots, okay? And so there was sediment. When the first glacier came down, it blocked up some of these lakes or river valleys that became lakes. And sediment started to pour into the lakes. And today you can see this sediment, this residual sediment that was deposited when the glaciers first came down and multiple times after that. So the question is, what's the age of those sediments? Because <coughs> that will tell us when the glaciers first came down. Well, a little technical, but I think I can explain it fairly simply. <coughs> this is a picture of, of the Earth here. And we all know that if you take a compass right here, it'll point north, which would be, I believe, in that direction. Am I right here? Okay, that direction. And the compass basically, the north arrow of it is drawn to the magnetic north pole. And that's how it's been for a long, long time. But there was a time when the mag magnetic uh, structure of the Earth flipped. And north became south, and south became north. So. Think of this as a little magnet, and here's the magnet, it flipped. And this is common in the geologic record. It flips backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and I won't get as to why. But the important thing is that if you've got sediment being deposited, I put this uh, mayonnaise jar here, and uh, there's water in it, and there's some gunk at the top, and there you can see it's cloudy. So stuff is settling out. And if there was a magnetic reversal while this is being settled out, at one time, north would be in this, this direction. And if the magnetic pole were to uh, shift while I was settling this thing out, then all of a sudden, north would be in that direction. And what's happened is there's a little magnetic minerals that line itself up to the North Pole. And so what happens when it flips, the newer magnetic minerals will orient themselves to the new North Pole. So if we know when this flipping occurred, then we have an idea when the glaciers came, because you see that flipping in those lake sediments. Well, it turns out the last flipping occurred 780,000 years ago. And we know that's when the first glacier came down. Okay? It's a little trick, but that's how we do it. We can't date the ice because the ice is gone. But we can date the first lake sediments that were produced when the ice blocked the drainage. So we, got a f we have a beginning. Now we go, well, is this really true? Uh, maybe there's a mistake and all that. Is there another way we can get at this? Because what we want to know is when did this landscape get changed? And when were the Great Lakes eroded out? Okay, well, we're going to go one more, okay? This is kind of a complicated thing, but I'm going to try to make it very simple. We're going to look at it from a global perspective and see if we can use that to figure out when the G Great Lakes were, 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 gr uh, was, were glaciated, okay? Here's the ocean, okay? And we all know the ocean is made out of water, and it's hydrogen and oxygen, and basically it's like uh, two hydrogens, these are my fists, and my head is the oxygen, okay? And that's your H2O, your normal uh, structure of a water molecule. My uh, two hydrogens and my oxygen, uh, you, you think of them as never being any different. Two oxygens, and, I mean two hydrogens and an oxygen. But the thing is, the oxygen can change. It can be different types of oxygen. One oxygen, has no neutrons associated with it. And the other oxygen has neutrons associated with it. And we call one without the neutron oxygen 16 and the other one oxygen 18. So let's pretend uh, 
oxygen 16 is me frowning, okay? And oxygen 18 is me, there we are, smiling. Okay, turns out when you evaporate water, it's the 16 that wants to evaporate more than the 18. And so as you remove water from the oceans to produce glaciers, what's happening, you're getting rid of the 16 and making it into ice, which is H2O, leaving behind the water molecules that are enriched in O18, okay? So all you're doing is, you're, we call it fractionating. We're increasing the concentration of O18 by making glaciers. Well, little critters live in the ocean, and they sense this. And what they do, they make their shells relative to the isotopic composition of the oceans. And so over time, if you have a core and you look at those shells and analyze them, you'll see the amount of oxygen 18 will shift over time, depending on how big the glaciers were. It's a nice little trick, okay? And so we can put together a graph here. And this graph goes back two million years. And every time the line goes over here and there's a blue shading, that means there's glaciation because the ocean was enriched in O18, okay? Over here, it wasn't enriched in O18. It's like it is today. So every time you see a, a movement to the left here, there's a gla glaciation. Every time you see a movement over here to the right, that's an interglacial or a warm period, much like it is today. So we see this line wiggle backwards and forwards. So we can see glaciers started at least about two million years ago, backwards and forwards, but they weren't very big. So they probably were limited to somewhere in northern Can Canada. But when we move up to right about here, we're about 900,000 years ago, all of a sudden the glaciers get really big. And that's when they started to come down to the Great Lakes. And that's when the erosion began. That's when they started digging out that shale. And then what happened is that the glacier retreated and it got a bit warm. And then it advanced and then it retreated. And every time it's like a shovel coming down, digging out. And then you walk and have lunch, come back down, dig it out again and got made those lakes deeper and deeper and deeper. And we can see backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And so when we look at the Great Lakes, they're the product of about nine glaciations, not just one glacier, but nine of them. And to digress a little bit here, which is kind of interesting, here's this interglacial period of time. And notice right there is when it was the warmest. Okay, and we're talking a little before uh, 500,000 years ago. And then here about the same temperature, the warmest period of time. Here was a little cooler, that interglacial period. There it was quite warm, and that's where we are today. So here's something that's interesting. The topic today is global warming. As a geologist, I kind of shrug my shoulder because I think of things in the past. I'm also a human being, which concerns me. But I look at it uh, 120,000 years ago, it'd be warmer than it is today. So it's just something that when you look at climate change, it depends on your perspective. You, if you look at it from a human uh, interval of time when humans were around, yes, it's, it's important. But if you look back into time, there are times when it has been warmer during interglacial. And so there's something going on in all of this backwards and forwards that you see in, in my illustration here is the result of uh, um, terrestrial uh, situations, where the sun is, the, uh, how the Earth orbits the sun, uh, how the Earth is tilted, Actually, the, the Earth is tilted relative to its orbit, but that tilt changes. And all those things 
accumulate and cause climate to be different and the glaciers grow and retract, grow and retract. The problem that we see today is that there's now another layer on top of that, that the, the atmosphere is changing. So we've kind of overridden the natural system. But this is a different, totally different lecture. Okay. Important thing here, the, the Great Lakes were first glaciated 900,000 years ago, and there have been about nine glaciations that altered the landscape. Well, we see some other evidence of these periods where there haven't been glaciers. And over here, we're seeing um, layers left behind by different glaciers. And sometimes, this is uh, in, in northern Indiana, there's a soil that's developed between the layers. So we have evidence of those past times when climate was as warm as it is today or maybe a bit warmer. So there's another line of evidence that we've had multiple glaciations eroding the landscape, changing the landscape. <coughs> there are also fossils that we can find that tell us something about climate. And the one that's really interesting is this one right there. This is near um, Toronto. And these are deposits that were left behind during the last interglacial, during that warm interval of time. And then there are these other little black dots and some of these other ones right here, the triangles. They represent fossils left behind or <coughs> wood left behind during or subsequent uh, from when the la uh, last interglacial occurred. And I'll use these to put together a story. These are the ones that occur in Toronto. And these are, you can see shells, you can see pieces of wood. There's actually teeth there. And that's how we know that the last interglacial was a bit warmer than it is today because there are species in this collection that don't occur now. Uh, it's just too cold. But back then it was warmer, so we know that there are, are these, uh, that these represent that. Now, let's look at the last glaciation, okay? Because that's the one we're most interested in because that's really what le left behind what we see outside here. When the glaciers formed, they first, the last one, formed about 900,000 years ago and it advanced all the way to this margin here. So further south is about the Ohio River. And when it got down to about this position, that was about 21,000 to 19,000 years ago. Okay? This is the last glaciation. It started, oops, I lost my mouse, there you go. It started about 90,000 years ago, got down here about or let, let's say 20,000 years ago, okay? The source of the ice, keep on losing, the, oh, there it is, was from two areas. One is right here, and it's referred to as the Kiwatan area, and the other source here was in the Quebec region. These were big domes, and this is where most of the accumulation of snow that turned into ice occurred, allowing for radiant flow outwards and eventually covering the Great Lakes region. So bas basically there are two centers of dispersion of ice. And if we were here or here and standing on the ice, you would find it's about one and 1.6 miles thick, very thick ice. But then as you get over to the edge here, it got thinner and basically we think it's about a fourth to about six tenths, four tenths to six tenths of a mile thick. So it's much thinner here. There's some arguments too that was even thinner than that uh, over the Great Lakes. But that gives you some idea of the dimensions of the ice sheet. There was also an ice sheet way over here along the west coast uh, called the Cordillon. Uh, ice sheet, but we're interested in this one, which is called the Laurentide Ice Sheet. 
Um, what happened then is the ice kind of stayed where it was, maybe moving backwards and forwards, the margin moving backwards and forwards for about 3,000 years. And then climate changed and it started to retreat. And this began about 18,000 years ago. The ice retreated and retreated northward. But it didn't retreat uniformly. It retreated, then changed its mind, came forward. Retreated, came forward. Retreated, came forward. And oftentimes when it retreated, vegetation would take hold. And then the ice overrode it and oftentimes buried that vegetation. Then retreated and did it again. So if we can find that vegetation, it gives us an idea of when these things occurred, when this backwards and forwards occurred. And basically, I've got some lines here. About 20,000 years ago, the ice was down in here. And then it retreated, and then we advanced to this position, about 15,500. Retreated, then advanced to this position, about 12,000 years ago, or 13,000 years ago. And this is, oops, where's my mouse? There we go. And that's the Port Huron moraine. That's the one that you can trace all the way across the landscape, all the way into Wisconsin. A single moraine. It's kind of very interesting. Then it retreated and then advanced to this position. Then it retreated and advanced to this position. And then finally, 9,000 years ago, it left the Great Lakes. So what we're seeing is the ice just didn't come down, smooth out the landscape, and then retreated. It went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And my interest is this backwards and forwards business. And so all <laughs> back in the 1980s, uh, I worked on a project of um, near Sheboygan, Michigan, which is just before the bridge. And a farmer was digging out uh, a pond, and he was digging out the soil, and he came across the peat, organic material. <coughs> and so I got really excited, and I got samples of the peat. And you can see it right there. There's some peat. And over it is some lake deposits, and then over it is glacial deposits. But this is just a little sample. And if you, s if I took it to the lab and sieved it, and what came out was little bryophytes. These, these are little mosses, okay? And then also twigs. And <coughs> these are alders, okay? Uh, dwarf alders. They're like little bushes. And then there are little shells. And then there are these. And I spent Christmas Eve in the herbarium at Michigan State University, Christmas Eve, mind you, trying to figure out these seeds. I couldn't figure them out, not at all. And I got so frustrated, I thought, well, maybe I can tell from the inside. So I cut it with a razor blade it was just mashed up stuff. Anybody know what these are? Mashed up vegetation. Probably seen these in your house, maybe. Mice. Mouse drops, right. <laughs> Mouse drops, you know. Um, yeah. So these are, if you look at them, 12,000 year old mouse drops, okay? because we could carbon date them. We can carbon date the bryophytes, we can carbon date the twigs, and we can carbon date the mouse droppings. They're actually called voles, but same thing as, uh, as a mouse. Also, I got a chance to work up in um, Lake Ribbon, which is in the upper part of the, or the upper peninsula. <coughs> and uh, there too was organic material that was overridden by the glacier. But it wasn't just these little things as uh, you can see here. There are actually trees, tree trunks. You can see those. 
And what we can do is we can carbon date these tree trunks, and these turned out to be about 10,500 years old. So we know when these advances and retreats and advances and retreats occurred. Okay, so this is the end result. This is what glaciation did, and we have as a takeaway the landscape that you see when you drive in lower Michigan or upper Michigan is the result of sculpturing from the glaciers and depositing of glacial sediments. The lakes that we see here, the Great Lakes, are the result of scooping out, eroding the softer rocks. Okay? So now we'll kind of move to the next section of this lecture, is the evolution of the lakes. We've done the origin, now the evolution. Well, what's happened here, if you look at these lakes, and do the geology, well, we find there were outlets, different outlets for the lakes that developed after glaciation. There's my mouse. There was one here in Chicago. There was one here uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. There's one here in Buffalo. There's one here uh, in Rome, New York. There's an outlet of a lake once here. There's an outlet of a lake once here and there's an outlet of a lake once here. And so what we see is <coughs> the Great Lakes have had different outlets at different points in time. And the reason that is, as the ice was retreating, some of the older or younger outlets were blocked, so water had to go out in a different direction. There's another thing that we can see. They're all beaches. If you go walk around and you know what you're looking for, you'll find that they're all beaches in Michigan, and these beaches can be dated. We know how old some of these beaches are. And so when we take all of this information together, we can come up with a history of the Great Lakes. By the way, if you're walking in the woods, this is on the Door Peninsula, that's a beach, okay? Water was on this side, and if you dug into this, you'd find it's all sand and gravel. But subsequently, it's been forested, so it's very subtle. But you find these throughout Michigan, and these are much higher than the present Great Lakes. So you knew that there were bigger lakes around at one time. And in fact, some of these beaches, if you follow them north, say I found one of these beaches and was able to trace it north and I kept on walking, the odd thing about it is the beach would get higher and higher and higher. And you go, that doesn't make any sense. You know, beaches ought to be flat. But these beaches are tilted towards the north. For example, there's a lake called Glacial Lake Algonquin. And there's, there's the beach. This is uh, uh, Port Huron, and this is way up to the north in the Upper Peninsula. And you see this beach, which is about 9,000 years, gets higher and higher as you go north. This is the current beach right here for the present day Great Lakes. What's happening? Well, again, if my right hand is towards the south, left hand, excuse me, uh, to the south, and this is the beach to the north. Well, at one time, the glaciers were very thick here, and it pushed the landscape, the crust of the earth down, okay? So you had a lake like this forming a beach, but then as the landscape came back up, started to uh, be uplifted, it also uplifted this old beach. And so what we see here is that this is the result of isostatic uplift. This is the readjustment of the crust due to the loading of the ice. Once the ice is gone, it comes back up. It's like getting out of your bed. You know, it, it sags. Well, if you have a sag bed, I guess. You get off, it comes back up. But in this case, it comes back up very slowly. But it's still coming back up, by the way. You know, about a millimeter a year, a millimeter or two a year. Okay. okay, so as I mentioned, you had different outlets. And I'm not going to go through the details of it, but let's look at this one. Here's the margin of the ice, okay? 
this dark line. This is about 16,000 years ago. And here was Lake Michigan. And it couldn't drain through the Straits of Mackinac because it was covered with ice. So there was a higher lake and it drained south through the, uh, the Chicago River down the Mississippi. Over here, you had part of Lake Huron. It, it has a different name, Glacial Lake Saginaw, and it drained east into the North Atlantic. Then about 14,000 years ago, the ice re-advanced further, almost uh, crowding out this, uh, this lake. And over here, we had another lake called Lake Maumee, and both of these drained south down to the Gulf of Mexico. The ice retreats, drainage is s from uh, Glacier Lake Saginaw goes all the way across Lake Michigan. This is the Grand Valley. Spilled into what was uh, uh, Lake Glacier Lake Chicago and then down the Chicago outlet. So you had this huge river, much like the Detroit River, going right across Michigan. And today, just a trickle. Then the ice retreats, and now the drainage is going back to the east. And this goes backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And again, we're dealing with 13,000 years ago. Everything's going south again. And then 11,800, it's going east. And then something happened here. The ice retreated far enough that where that landscape was really, really pushed down. The ice retreated, and you had this very, very low outlet. And it caused the lakes to drop precipitously. And as you can see, this the lake was very small here and here, just a few ponds. Lake Erie was smaller, Lake Ontario was smaller. And basically, this drainage went right across this part of Canada and then down into the uh, St. Lawrence Bay. And today, we've actually seen this lake evolve to almost the present day uh, uh, Great Lakes. And this was called Glacial Lake Nipissing. The upper five Great Lakes all became one level. And what happened is this outlet right here rose and rose and rose and rose, causing the lake to get higher and higher, flooding that the basins. And the end result, Glacial Lake Nipissing was about 15 feet higher right here in Holland than the present day lake. And in fact, if you look at some of these lakes, we'd be underwater right now. The water level would be way above us. And then eventually, one other thing happened. There was actually a sixth great lake. This is Glacial Lake Agassiz. It was huge, and it was held up right there. But when the ice left, it catastrophically spilled into the Great Lakes, probably lifting the water level very, very high. And this is uh, 11,600 years ago. And if you were standing on the beach right here on Lake Michigan, you'd be in trouble because the water would come up very, very rapidly. And there were actually human beings living here, the Paleo-Indians or indigenous people, and they would have seen this. I, I don't think they would have drowned, but they would have been hightailing it because the water would just have gone up. And if they had encampments by the water, they would have recognized something's happening. Okay. Eventually, though, we ended up with this our present Great Lakes, the end product of an evolution that is a result of the geology, as well as the glacier, as well, or, or glaciers, as well as the occupation of different outlets over time. And today, the lake level is much lower than <coughs> that high lake level that I just talked about, Lake Nipissing, because the outlet over here in Lake Huron has been eroding down, causing the lake to drop down to its present position. Okay? That's how we got here. 
This is basically the story of how the Great Lakes <coughs> got to where they were. But there's another story that is more in the present, and that is the story of basically what's happening to our shoreline. And particularly this past year, you've obviously heard on the news uh, all the erosion that has occurred along the shore of Lake Michigan due to that uh, extraordinarily high lake level. So I just want to touch on that lake level and also touch on the erosion rate, okay? So we're going to focus in on the lower part of the uh, Lake Michigan because this is more of our interest. That's because this is where we are. Okay. Well, if we go back in time about 5,000 years ago, that was when Glacial Lake Nipissing occurred. And it was basically in feet now. Uh, I've got it here, 592 feet above sea level. Okay right there. And today, we're about 600, and I mean 580, okay? So if you look at the difference between these two, we can see that quite a few feet difference, okay? That, uh, uh, let's just do this, uh, 580 relative to uh, um, 591, five, so, you know, about 15 feet. Yeah. Big, big difference, okay? I think I did the math there, right? Yeah. Okay, so what we're seeing now is this, this drop about 4,500 years ago was due to the erosion of the outlet at Port Huron. And then since then, the lakes have been fairly stable, but there have been bumps up and down, up and down, up and down. And these are climatic. This is a result of climatic change over the last 3,000 years or, you know. They've been stable, but they've been going up and down, up and down, so it's not unusual, okay? But let's look at the more modern period right in here, because that's what we're interested in. In this graph that I pulled out uh, just uh, yesterday, and again, hopefully you can see it. The, they always put small numbers on graphs, and I always have to, my students, put big ones so I can see them, <laughs> okay? This is the present level of Lake Michigan, and here's the years. And what's interesting about Lake Michigan is we have records of the level that goes back to 1860. And this goes up to about 2019. And so what we can see is back in, you know, about 1860 to 1880s, the lake level was high, and then it kind of went up and down, up and down. Here's a low sequence of lakes, you know, lake levels. And then it kind of came up and down in general, and then down again, and then up again. And superimposed on this curve, let's start from here. If we just did this, a general curve, we would see it would kind of go like this except for that little jump in there. It would come up and then down and then up and down. But superimposed are these little ones, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And so since we're more interested in right here, because this is the present, let's see what's going on right here. This is going from January 1969 to October 2021, again, I pulled this out yesterday. And here is the mean lake level right about, oop, right about there, okay? And we can see it was pretty high. Let's see if I can see this. Uh, well, that this is about the 69s, uh, 1970. And then it was fairly low during the 1980s. And this is when I did much of my work because lake level was low and I could see the bluffs and everything being eroded. And what my job was or what I did is I walked all of the beaches. I've walked the entire beach from the Indiana border all the way up to the Straits. And I do that once. And then I do the same thing in a little boat. And I take pictures. And then periodically I get beach the boat and then climb up the bluffs. 
uh, take samples, look at the geology, get yelled at by the residents for, you know, they don't want to see me there. And, uh, but this is how I put together the geology. But what you can see is that there was a very low period right in here, but in the 1980s, it was, uh, you know, 1960s, 1970s, into the 80s, it was very high and then low, and then it started to rise again. And then uh, right here is last winter. And actually, that's the record high. That's a record high of our historical data. Okay? And now it's coming back down. Okay? And what happens when you work for the Corps of Engineers, during these periods of time when lake level is high, you get yelled at by property owners because the Corps must be doing something. When it's low, you get yelled at by boaters because the uh, harbors are too shallow. They can't get their boats in. And now more recently, the property owners have been after the Corps of Engineers. And so here, though, there's another thing. When the lake level is high, it, it accelerates erosion. And that's another reason that they're after the Corps of Engineers, because anything that happens in the Great Lakes, people believe it's the, the fault of the Corps of Engineers. But it's not. It's climatic. It's basically climatic, except for some certain situations. And uh, I'm, unless people have questions on that, I won't get into that. So what about the erosion? Well, here's a map of the southern part of Lake Michigan, and you can see the band of different colors here. This is the inner band. And what these colors represent is the rate of erosion during historical times. Historical time means things that have been written down in documents. For example, when they did the uh, roads, the original roads here was uh, roads along section lines. Well, they surveyed those back in the uh, 1830s all the way to the shore of Lake Michigan. And they knew from the intersection to the shore what the distance was. Well, today you look at that distance and it's shorter. And the difference between what it was back in the 1830s and today gives you an idea of erosion, how much. Another way is to look at aerial photographs since about the 1930s that you can actually see how, how much step back is occurring. So when we look at this color here, the brown color, that's the most amount of erosion. And this is meters per year. So think of, of it about th three feet per year. So about three feet per, per year. And you can see here are the browns, okay? Particularly down near St. Joseph, pretty severe. We've got some here too, here. Over here, you don't have browns, but you have yellows and these blue colors and all that. And right there's Holland. And we can see that in some instances, you're actually accreting. That means the shore is moving outwards, okay? So not everything's eroding. Down here's the worst part. That's the, we're dealing with anywhere from about three feet to one or two feet per year and mainly because lake level is high and you have all the storm winds coming in from the northwest and you produce waves that build and build and build and build and eventually hit this area. Here you don't have so much because coming out of like the uh, um, Grand River, it delivers sand and it augments the beach, it protects it. And in some cases, as more sand comes down, you actually build up the beach. But in other cases, you destroy the shoreline. And so that's what it is. It's a balance between destruction and construction. And during high lake levels, the destruction dominates, although it doesn't occur all along the shore, but in a number of places. Even over here in Wisconsin, you can see there's been considerable erosion. How long be be uh, beyond the historical record. Well, I've played around with that, and this is just something I, I thought you might be interested in. This is a map here. I think we're about here somewhere. Okay, But this is St. Joseph area. 
and these lines represent moraines, okay? The, the uh, basically the edge of the ice, a buildup of material along the edge of the ice when the ice was advancing this way. This is just one of those re-advances. And we can see the moraine goes like that, and then it's truncated by the present shore. And we could extrapolate it where it was, kind of like this. And so the ice left this point about 16,000 years ago, and so this was the shoreline then, okay? Now it's here. And if you look at the difference from there to there, that's about four miles. And so that's four miles within 16,000 years. And I just did back of the envelope calculation. It's about one or two feet per year. So, you know, there are places where it's been severe, but it's nothing out of the unusual. It's just climatic. The Corps of Engineers uh, are not doing this. Th some cases, they, they're culpable, but we'll talk about that in another day. Well, I thank you all for coming, and uh, I hope you've learned something. And before you leave, I, I want you to get rid of that Michigan mask, okay? <laughs> thank you so much. We do have some questions in the chat, so I'm not sure I'm ready to have you take that off okay, yet. Yes, okay. I'd be um, glad any questions, fine. I appreciate yeah. it. So we have three questions in the chat. Why don't I go ahead and read the first two and then we'll open it up for questions in the classroom. Would that be okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay, I'll great. The first question, it was a while back, but isn't the Leelanau Peninsula in the lower peninsula? Yes, not you're right. Way? It's a Keweenaw. I recognize that when I was talking and I was hoping nobody was going to ask me that. <laughs> ah! It's a Keweenaw. But I have worked on the Leelanau Peninsula and um, that is not because of bedrock. That's, uh, that's made out of all glacial materials. And in fact, if you go to Sleeping Bear Dunes and you look over the cliff, um, that's all glacial sediments. Those, the, the cliff is not dune. A lot of people think the whole thing's a dune. No, it's just the stuff on top. These are called perch dunes. Sleeping Bear is a perch dune, but it sits on glacial sands. So the whole thing is not a dune. Right. Thank you. And, um, uh, and thanks for pointing that out. I really appreciate it. <laughs> the second question that I have out of three is why did the glaciers retreat from Michigan in the upper Midwest, but glaciers remain for now in Glacier National Park near the Canadian border? Yeah, they're, they're residuals. We still have residuals uh, of the last glaciation. There are glaciers in the um, Baffin Island regions of, of Canada. Uh, you get still glaciers in Switzerland. You get glaciers in Iceland. But there are still some residual glaciers from the last continental glaciation. Um, how long those will last, I really can't tell you. It all depends on, on climate and probably the influence of human beings on the climate. But yeah, in fact, if you go to Glacier National Park, um, those, those guys, there's three what we call surf glaciers. If you ever go there, you'll see them uh, way up high between the uh, 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 peaks. And I don't think those are going to last for more than about 30 years. They'll be gone. In fact, the, the uh, glacier that I did my PhD on is about gone, and that was a big glacier. Mm. There was another question, I believe. Thank you. Yes, there's one more. Is there any truth to changing the flow over Niagara Falls affecting the depth of our Lake Michigan and others? No, I don't think that's uh, possible. Um, no, you'd have to erode that Silurian dolomite, and you, you can't really erode the upstream deeper than where the rivers are going, the Atlantic Ocean. So that wouldn't be possible. Um, hopefully, it'll continue to flow over the Niagara Falls because uh, we have uh, power generators there, and that's renewable energy. You want that. You want, want the falls to continue to be there because they've got turbines that uh, <coughs> divert some of the water from the Niagara River 
down through tunnels into the turbines and then on out. So really we're robbing some of the flow over Niagara Falls, but most people don't know that. Yes, uh, there's a gentleman back there. Yeah, the question that I was asked is uh, with the different, well, the uplift occurring more in the north versus the south, uh, will it have any effect on lake level and on erosion? And I think I can answer that from this illustration. Up here is where the m maximum uplift is occurring, and down here is where less uplift is occurring, and for geophysical reasons, actually what's happening, this part is getting lower, okay? Um, it's not only tilting this way, but this side is tilting a bit lower than this, and it's due to uh, a, let's call it a bump in the mantle material. It, it's kind of involved, but <coughs> it is tilting, and as it tilts, think of it this way, that you have a bathtub, okay? and there's a water line. And if you lift one end of the bathtub up, this end of the bathtub, the water's going to get lower. Okay? All right. That end, what's going to happen? If you lift up the bathtub, the water level gets high. If you lift it all the way up, it finally overflows the sill. And one could say if this uplift continues, uh, one could reoccupy the Chicago River as an outlet. But we're, that's a long time from now, and there'll be other things happening like the erosion of the Port Huron outlet, so it won't happen, but theoretically if it's this bathtub argument that if you lift one side up, the other side becomes lower relative to this side. The water level in the north will drop, water level in the south will rise, and eventually it'll overflow. Good question. Yes. Can you say anything about the average age of the water in the Great Lakes? Oh, I couldn't pull that out from the top of my head. Um, I what couldn't is do the that. Question? I I've read it, but I don't remember it, uh, and I would just be lying to you if I told you I knew it. Yeah, it. Yeah, it's um, the retention interval, but it, it, what basically happens in this in instance is a balance between precipitation and drainage, and the, it's called residence time for any molecule of water to reside in their body would be residence time, and I I should know it, but I don't and. You know, I could make it up and no one here would know, but maybe somebody on watching me would know and then I'd get an email, you dummy, you know, that kind of stuff. Probably more than a week. Oh, much more than a week, yeah, much more, yeah. I have one more question on chat right now. Yes, um, right. He's asking a question about slide 17.9. Is that something you could go back to? 17.9, right there. Okay, so it says you described the retreat of the Laurentide ice sheet listing specific time periods. I think it says 11.4 Ka, which is thousand. So I'm thinking 11.4 thousand, um, 11.8 thousand, et cetera. Can you briefly describe how these time markers can be measured so accurately? Okay. Um. Right, um, right there, uh, near Marquette, just southwest of Marquette, is Lake Gribbon. And Lake Gribbon, uh, I showed you in a slide, it has that forest bed, okay? And it 
got uh, overridden by outwash or sand and gravel associated with the glacier. So we know that the glacier was, let me see again, was about here at that time, okay? Because we dated those tree trunks. And then the glacier retreated. We know it has to retreat after that. And if you retreat the ice, it's going to open up this outlet here, okay? And that allows this lake to drain through the Great Lakes. So that's how we come up with these numbers. That for Lake Shibor I mean the Sheboygan bryophyte bed that I worked on allowed us to know when the ice retreated from here, when the ice retreated from, from there. And <coughs> those dots that I showed you, I think I can, there we go, oops, one more. There we go. All these dots you see, there's Gribbon Lake. It says Lake Gribbon, but the, the name is really, uh, yeah, Gribbon Lake. But all these dots are where we find buried organic material. And we use those to know or figure out when the ice was last there. <coughs> okay. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, when you go back and look at the geology, I'm going to have to go way back. Right there. These are the moraines that we see, and these are piles of debris, unsorted, unstratified, or unlayered piles of debris that form these ridges. Mm -hmm. But be in addition to those, there are masses of sand and gravel. For example, if you go to Kalamazoo, where the, the Kellogg Biological Station is, that is a big plain of sand and gravel left behind by <coughs> water flowing out of the glacier. Another thing that uh, is a good indication of all of the uh, flow of water, if you uh, go down to Zealand, okay, that's a big delta that uh, discharged into one of the higher levels of Lake Michigan probably around 15, 16,000 years ago. Also, if you go up to, um, uh, I'm trying to think, um, Grand Rapids, that's the head of another delta that extended out into Lake Michigan and that had its source from all this meltwater and gravel being um, discharged into the, into the lake. There are other things that tell us, um, we don't have them around here, but ha has anybody uh, heard the word esker, E-S-K-E-R? That's um, a, a ridge, a different type of ridge that is made out of sand and gravel, and it, it, it basically has a circuitous path. It's a ridge, but it wiggles, okay? And it was deposited by sand and gravel being deposited in a tunnel under the glacier. And that's because of drainage carrying all of this stuff up and then it fills the, the tunnel up and then it finds another way to go. And you don't see them in the Lake Michigan lobe, but in the Saginaw lobe you see a lot of them and um, uh, around Lansing, yeah. there are a lot of them. Um, in fact, uh, the early settlers, a, as well as the indigenous people, would use the eskers uh, as trailways because they're high, they're good drainage, and uh, you know they're, they're perfect for for a path and later a road. Um, here, it's pretty flat. No reason. If you look around, I mean, when you get to Holland, Michigan, it's flat, and the reason that is, you, you're on a lake bottom. This is all lake bottom sediment. And um, the only other thing, uh, 
um, I was going to say of interest around here. Uh, <laughs> um, are your dunes? Are your dunes? Okay. And, and so your lake sediments and dunes, and what happens is you've got the beaches, uh, the dunes have been, uh, sand are being blown over and covering the lake sediments. Okay. You've got some other interesting things here, Hope College, you know. <laughs> All right. My daughter went to Alma, so, you know. I know, th in fact, I'll tell you, Michigan's got some real fine liberal arts colleges. They're, they're great institutions. I'm from a big MUU, you know, college, uh, Michigan State. Uh, you know, we're talking almost 50,000 students, but I went to a liberal arts college um, at Ohio Wesleyan, and I think they're fine. I'll take a graduate student from a liberal arts college any day before one from a state school. Um, not including Ohio State. I'll take anybody <laughs> from Ohio. Okay. And yes. And I was a freshman at Alma College. <laughs> I took geology one on one, and I wanted him to tell us um, about sinks that you that you went to see on the seafloor, where the the, the ground is kind of open, and lots of different kinds of sea creatures around. Is that okay. <coughs> Um, a uh, member of the audience had the good fortune to go to Alma, a very good school. <laughs> um, high tuition, I know that for a fact. Um, um, the young lady mentioned that on a field trip, they went to an area where it was a depression in the ground, a sink. And um, that those sinks that Depends, where did you see the sinks? Were they near Alma? No, they were farther north, I would say, in the, either in the Gaylord area. Okay. Yeah, in the Gaylord, th the reason I bring that up, there are two ways you can get depressions in the landscape. And one is called a sinkhole, and that's where the underlying limestone has dissolved. It absorbs into uh, limestone caves. Sometimes it dissolves and then it collapses, producing a sinkhole. You see that in Florida. A lot of people will have a house and all of a sudden it falls into a hole. They do have them in Michigan, but those are mainly near the Alpena, Rogers City area. The other kind of thing that looks like a sinkhole is called a kettle lake. And a kettle lake is a produced by a piece of ice that's become detached from the glacier as it retreats. And when it melts, eventually, it leaves a hole in the ground. And that would be a, a, a kettle. And in most instances, the water table is higher than the bottom of the kettle, and you end up with a kettle lake. Okay? Um, I'm going to tell you a story if you're not bored. Okay? When I first came to Michigan, I was a proud PhD and with a assistant professorship at uh, Michigan State, and I rented a, a, a cottage near a Lake Lansing. It's a kettle lake, and there was a carpenter doing some work on it, and, you know, he had suspenders and uh, kind of a floppy hat and a beard, and, uh, you know, I was talking to him, and he turned to me and said, so what are you doing here in Michigan? And I said, well, I am a professor at Michigan State. And he goes, oh, um, what kind of thing do you study? And I said, uh, I'm a geologist, and particularly a glacial geologist. And he says, what's that? And I said, well, do you see this lake here? Um, this lake was left behind by a glacier that once covered Michigan about 20,000 years ago. And he looked at me, and then he says, you believe in the Bible? And I said, oh, no, here we go. <laughs> and I said, well, there are parts of it that I believe and other parts that I don't believe. And he looked at me and said, what part don't you believe? <laughs> and I said, the burning bush, 
He said, what don't you believe about it? I said, well, I've never seen a burning bush that's still alive and burning. You know? And he said, oh, well, I ain't never seen no glacier in Michigan. <laughs> I have... Um I have a couple more questions in yes. chat. Now we okay. are at 2.30, so if you are either on Zoom or in the classroom, you are officially excused, but do you have a few more minutes if I had a couple questions left for you? Okay, yeah, go ahead. The first one is, um, you talk about sand and gravel. Can you explain the muck fields in this area? The muck fields in this area are basically, okay, Along the shore of Lake Michigan, um, you, you see these lakes, inland lakes, just in inland from the shore. You have one here. I forget what the name of it is. It, uh, what is it? Say it again. Makatawa. Okay. <coughs> and these kind of lakes are common along the shore of Lake Michigan, just inland from the coast. And what's happened is when the when lake level dropped during that precipitous time, about 9,000 uh, 9, years ago, the rivers dug in because lake level was so much lower. So the river valleys dug and dug and dug. Then the lake, lake Michigan came back up and it drowned those valleys. And so what you see are drowned valleys here. And the margins, the lake margin of them, <coughs> is where dunes and, and spits and beaches are uh, holding it in. Now, also, there's some other low areas that didn't get eroded that far down, but when the lake level came up, they're real wet. And that's how you get those marshes. Okay? Yeah, I was curious about the Driscoll area in southeastern Minnesota. Um, mm -hmm. That, that's right. Uh, uh, again, that's Minnesota. It's a little bit out of my territory, but it was glaciated at one time, but that was a long, long time ago. The most recent glacier or glaciation didn't get that far, and so there's no drift or glacial deposits there. But the landscape was somewhat uh, uh, sculptured by previous glaciers. That's about the best explanation at this time I can give you without going into something much more complicated. Okay, I have one more here. Actually, two more. It's two part. What can you tell us about any significance to Holland Heights? And then an adjunct to that would be what about the Grand Valley ravines? Okay, could you uh, repeat the first part of the question? Sure. Can you tell us about any significance to Holland Heights? Holland's height? Ho Holland Heights. Holland Height. Oh, okay. I, I know what that is. Okay. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an elevated area, a little bit higher than the rest of Holland, and that's a terrace. Basically, um, as a river erodes down, it erodes down <coughs> a certain distance, and then the river moves it a little different, uh, moves to the right or to the left, and it leaves this terrace behind and then erodes down, and then might erode down elsewhere. So you get these stair steps, okay? That's probably what's happening here, or it might be part of the Zealand Delta um, that is a bit higher than the surrounding area. I'd have to look at it. Uh, I've mapped it, but I wouldn't know, you know, the name Holland Heights isn't something I would be uh, focusing in on. I, I look at the geology. Um, maybe maybe uh, if you look at my email, um, Tom, can you distribute my email. I, I could look it up if you have it. Anybody has a question, I'd be uh, happy to respond on email if you're interested. Okay. Thank you so much. If there aren't any other questions in the classroom, um, maybe we could have Tom just close the class for us. Thank you very much and uh, been enjoyable and I hope you have a good week.
Thank you from everybody at home. I'm going to go ahead and close the Zoom class.